welcome to the eighth session of secrets of spirituality i was discussing the classifications of yoga in the last session a brief recap now basically the purpose of yoga is for self realization which simply means that the process of yoga as told in sanskrita yuj yunakti yumte yuj is the root word or dhatu in sanskrita yoga is the ghan pratyaya for this dhatu so as such the meaning of yoga means union union with what union of the ego with the self as long as the ego exists ego does not understand the existence of the self and the self is in no way going to exhibit itself to the ego to give an example water is in no way going to exhibit itself to the fish but as long as the fish has the ego fish cannot realize the water if fish has to realize water fish has to make an effort to be in unison with water water is always in unison with the fish water has never left the fish but the fish has not connected itself to water now you may ask a question why self has made this ego to be that way for that the answer is that ego is imparted with the a uh, finite amount of freedom or free will so that about 75% of the body's functionality will happen by means of the natural processes and the remaining 25% can be imparted as freedom itself so that the ego will evolve into a better ego or ego will evolve evolve into a better being as such if this freedom is not given then there may not be improvement by self effort so that way the divinity gave a freedom to the human beings when human beings were evolved from apes such that let the human beings understand themselves and let the human beings understand the cause for their existence i should say that this is one type of experiment that has happened with the human beings and i should also say that this experiment is not really highly successful to some extent the experiment is successful but to some extent or to a larger extent this experiment has been unsuccessful i cannot say that the experiment is a failure because there is nothing called failure with the one which has created the life in this universe there is nothing called as failure with the one that is omnipotent omniscient and omnipresent to illustrate with one more example when an artist is using the brush and the colors for painting an art form now the artist is with the art form only the artist is not away from the art form same way when the musician is composing the music for a song the musician is with the music only the musician is not away from the music now an engineer when he is designing or when she is designing an engine now the engineer is with the design of the engine only the engineer is not away from the engine similarly when a medical doctor is treating a patient the medical doctor is with the patient only the doctor is not away from the patient now with all these examples 
Now come to a conclusion that how the creator can be away from the creation. This is the basic question which every spiritual aspirant should ask. How the creator can be away from the creation? When the creator is involved in creation, how the creator can be away from the creation? Which simply means that the creator is always with the creation. Because creation cannot happen without the creator's presence there. Now this simply means that when the creator has created the life forms, the creator is always with the life forms. The creator has not relinquished himself or itself or herself from the life forms. For this creator, we can use a masculine gender, we can use a feminine gender, we can use a neuter gender. Actually, it is genderless. We are going to use these three genders just because in our language we have these three genders. Water is neither male nor female nor neuter. Water has no gender. But in our language we have these three genders. That is the reason we use these words. We cannot say water as it because water itself has the creative aspect of creating fishes within itself. If at all we say that water is it, then we are actually denoting it as an object which is going to be wrong because the object will not have any creative aspect. But the water has its own creative aspect. We cannot say water as he because water has no masculine gender. We cannot say water as she because it has no feminine gender. Then in what way we have to address water? which has got a creative aspect. Now we have no other choice. We can keep using all these three forms. That is how Vedas declare God in the neuter gender. Vedas say Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma Vijnanam Anandam Brahma There they use neuter gender. But in so many Puranas God is depicted in the masculine gender as the father of the universe. Similarly, even in the same Puranas, the God is depicted in the feminine gender also in the mother form. Adi Shankara has written two beautiful poems called Shivananda Lahari and Saundarya Lahari. In the Shivananda Lahari, Adi Shankara addresses God in the masculine form as Shiva, as father. In the Saundarya Lahari, Adi Shankara again denotes God in the feminine form as the mother. But the same Adi Shankara, when he writes the Bhashyas or the commentaries for the Upanishads, he denotes the same God in the neuter gender as Brahma. That is when he gives a detailed explanation for the four Vedic sentences. Aham Brahmasmi, Tattvamasi, Ayamatma Brahma, Prajnanam Brahma. In all these four sentences, Brahma word is neuter word. So that way, we are expressing the genderless one with the gender because in our language we have these genders. Now to come back to the discussion, the creator cannot be away from the creation. The creator has to be always with the creation. Let us say a cook is cooking food. When the cook is cooking food, he cannot be away from the process of cooking. If he is away from the process of cooking, cooking will not happen. So the cook has to be along with the cooking process. When a mechanic is repairing a vehicle, the mechanic has to be with the vehicle. Now, without the vehicle, the mechanic cannot be actually repairing the vehicle. Mechanic's presence is required. When a teacher is teaching to the students, the teacher cannot be away from the students. The teacher has to be with the students. Then only teaching process happens. You can relate this way to so many other things. You can visualize so many such examples. 
when a dancer is dancing when a dancer is performing the dance the dancer cannot be away from the dancing process dancing will never happen that way the dancer is always exhibiting the dancing process means the dance and the dancer are one and the same at that time now if all these examples are understood by you ask yourself a sincere question how can a creator be away from the creation and how is it possible but the one that is getting created or the one that is already being created that one will think that the creator is elsewhere that is the height of stupidity throughout the world in any religion in any faith system in any spiritual system the great masters have been telling this truth since time immemorial in many 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 ways still people have not understood the basic fact that creator cannot be away from the creation creator has to be with the creation when socrates told one great sentence that know thyself people did not understand him actually socrates was much ahead of its his age i should say that socrates did not belong to that particular age where he was compelled to drink poison and to die because of the sentence which he told know thyself whatever socrates told as know thyself same thing is told in the veda as tat tvam asi same thing is told by the jesus christ as the kingdom of god is within when jesus christ told me and my father are one the same meaning is told in aham rahma asmi when prophet muhammad says that allahu akbar la ilaha illallah the same meaning is there in the veda as satyam jnanam anantam brahma so irrespective of any religion irrespective of any faith system irrespective of any belief system when people stop being selfish then only union will happen so the process of yoga is shedding the ego only then self will be realized for shedding the ego a systematic practice of becoming egoless is required unless people become egoless they cannot say that they have realized the self for that matter any self realized person will not say that he or she is realized if anyone says that the person is self realized then you should not believe that person because the person who claims that he or she is realized then the realization of the the, the expression of the realization is coming through the words and the words are coined by the ego itself any fish which has realized water will never say that it has realized water but then you may ask again if a fish has realized water how will you know you need not know you should be that fish which realizes the water self realization is not for boosting ego further because self realization is happening only when the ego is dissolved now how come the same ego can once again express that it has realized the self when fish loses its ego the fish will realize water now if fish says that i have realized water then it is again saying that through the ego only that is why i repeat the sentence any self realized person will never say that he or she is realized i have told you the life history of sadashiva brahmendra he was a great self realized yogi but in the whole of his life approximately for 300 years he lived 
he never told in a sentence that he has realized the self when we look at his life we are damn sure we are quite convinced that he is a self realized master he is a self realized yogi we understand that he is at a much greater level than us but he will never say that he is at a much greater level than us because that is going to boost his ego again he wants to remain egoless as such samadhi is what samadhi is basically egolessness so i repeat the sentence again third time any self realized person will never say that he or she is realized whether a person is realized or not he is going to be known to the world by their lifestyle by their way of treating others by their way of approaching life i should tell you a story of sant ekanatha who was there in the state of maharashtra some decades or some centuries before this ekanatha was a great saint and ekanatha had made a resolution that he will not become angry for anything as such and the people knew that this saint ekanatha had taken a resolution or resolve that he is not going to become angry now there are some miscreants in that village those miscreants somehow wanted to make ekanatha angry somehow they tried in many other ways he always used to smile even when he was troubled by these miscreants he always used to smile and he was always used to remain silent he always used to keep on chanting the lord's name one day this miscreants thought that we are in the village and ekanatha knows us so whatever we do to him he may not become angry at all now this miscreant thought somehow we have to make him angry santa ekanatha had a habit of going to the river bank every day taking bath there then coming up then visiting a temple and sitting in the temple keeps on chanting the lord's name that was his regular habit one day a new comer came to the village when the new comer came to the village the miscreants observed this fellow who came to the village and uh, even though he was a stranger these people told him the miscreants told him that you are anyhow coming in new to our village we will tell you to do a task you do it and we will give you enough money now this fellow thought i have come newly to the village and these people are saying that i have to do something they will give me money let me earn this money let me ask what they are asking me to do so he asked them they told you can see that old man that old man every day morning he goes to the river he takes bath there then he comes up what you do is as soon as he takes bath and when he comes up you spit on him in fact these miscreants wanted ekanatha to become angry so they told this newcomer you spit on him now the newcomer told what will happen will you not become angry will you not fight with me then the miscreant told you don't worry he is very old he is very old he will not attack you if he tries to attack you we are there for your support he will never harm you in any way you don't have to worry you just do as we say we are going to give you enough money you simply spit on him though the newcomer did not know that it was the great saint ekanatha so they told tomorrow morning you do this particular task and we will be waiting at the river bank to give you the money and they showed him a big bag of money as well they lured him and the person decided okay let me earn this money easily by spitting on this old man next day morning when sant ekanatha was having a bath and afterwards when he was coming up on the steps this person went there and he 
spat on him. When he spat on him, Ekanatha simply looked at him, smiled and he went back to the river. He took the dip once again in the water, then he came up. When he came up, actually when he, before he was coming up, the miscreants who were sitting there uh, in the hidden form, they already gave a sign to the newcomer to spit once again. Now Ekanatha went back, he took a dip in the water once again. When he was coming up through the steps, this person again spat on him. Ekanatha smiled at him again when he went back and he took a dip and again he came back, the person again spat on him. This went on for many number of times. After some time, this person did not have any saliva in his mouth to spit further. Okay. Now Ekanatha went again down and he took a dip in the water. He came up and he again stood in front of the fellow and he smiled at him. Now Ekanatha was prompting the person to spit once again. But the person did not have a saliva in his mouth. And he was seeing that Ekanatha is still smiling on him. This person became so much guilty. This person thought, I am spitting on an old man and this old man did not become angry in spite of I spitting on him so many times. He simply smiles, again goes down, takes a dip in the water, again comes up. Now he is waiting for me to spit on him. What a shame that I have been doing this heinous act just to earn some fast money. Now the, this particular newcomer to the village, he fell on Ekanatha's feet and he begged pardon from Santa Ekanatha and he told him that I did not do it on my own and he showed his finger toward those miscreants who were there sitting in a hidden form. Immediately all those people ran away, the miscreants ran away. Now this fellow again fell down to Ekanatha's feet and he told, I did a very heinous act. Those people told me that they will give me a lot of money if I spit on you in the early morning. That is why I came. I did not know who you are. Now I know that you are not a small person. You are a very great person. And I have done the greatest wrong thing in my life by insulting you in this way. Now Ekanatha told, if you could have told me in the beginning itself that they are going to give you a lot of money if you spit on me and if I become angry, I would have become angry at that time immediately, man. If you wanted a money to be given to you from them, that would make them also happy. That would make you also happy. You could have told me in the beginning itself, I would become angry immediately. So that you could take the money and you could go. And even they would be happy that they made me angry. But my dear friend, you gave me a chance to take dip in the water and to take bath along with the Lord's name so many times. Actually, you did a very good thing for me today. Otherwise, I would take bath in this holy river only once. Because of you, I took bath in this holy river so many times chanting the Lord's name. That way, you have not done a bad thing, you have done a good thing. Again, the fellow fell on the feet of Santa Ekanatha and he sobbed and he cried, Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I have done a great insult to a holy man. And Santa Ekanatha blessed him and told him, don't worry, go away. I am going to the temple to chant Lord's name. Now, my dear friends, understand Ekanatha's personality. Such great people, they have never told that they have realized the self. But actually, their life itself is a great example for people like us to understand that they are the self-realized masters. So, they are great yogis. Even though the word yoga is in Sanskrita, I should say that 
prophet muhammad was also a great yogi even though in their tradition they call him as prophet or messenger that way all yogis are messengers only right all yogis give great messages to the world i should also say that jesus christ was also a great yogi because they all had unison with the self or unison with the lord or unison with the divinity even though others say that they are all channels of god or they are all messengers of god actually all of us are embodiment of the self itself creator cannot be away from his creation creator has to be always with the creation but the creation may not understand the creator that is why the creator gives a certain amount of freedom to the human beings to understand the creator now if the human beings do not put this effort of understanding the creator of what worth this life would be i should also say that even socrates was a great yogi he was a great realized person otherwise the great sentence know thy self that itself is enough you need not know thy ego but you have to know thy self and that should be the primary purpose of life once you know thy self then you know that life is the gift of the self for this purpose only very systematically the science of yoga was evolved since millenniums the science of yoga has been there pre vedic period also because in the vedas itself such great truths are declared and later on so many yogis have written yogic upanishads also we should say that the science of yoga has been there since many millenniums because the art of self realization or the science of self realization was thought to be very essential for living a quality life otherwise people are lost with eight types of arrogances and six types of enemies as already been told in the previous presentation so there are various forms of yoga but in the shiva samhita he mainly classifies these four types of yoga mantra yoga laya yoga hatha yoga and raja yoga i had explained about these four types in detail in the previous session so let me go further this classification is as per shiva samhita maharshi patanjali's system of ashtanga yoga is a combination of all of the above yogic methods okay so there is some message in the chat box which is not having any meaning there anyway better you people you know, instead of play mischief so classification is as per shiva samhita now maharshi patanjali i keep calling him as the greatest scientist on this earth why he developed the system of ashtanga yoga yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadhi as a combination of all of the above yogic methods otherwise in general what happens is the people who are involved in the mantra yoga they keep on chanting only the mantras they keep on studying only the mantras or they keep on studying only the scriptures and they are lost in that particular way only they may not meditate for example in the hindu system there are so many temples all over the country and there are so many priests who have memorized the vedic suktas now the point is have they understood the vedic suktas have they really understood the meanings of those vedic suktas 
If they understood the meaning of the Vedic suktas, they would become self-realized long back. But when we look at their lifestyle, they are doing all these worships for the sake of their livelihood only. Most of them are not at all making an effort for self-realization. That means, in the process of chanting the mantras, it became part of their profession. It, is, it became a means for their livelihood. And they are lost that way. Now coming to Laya Yoga. Laya Yoga is basically meditation. Now we have thousands of meditation centers all over the world. Not only thousands, maybe ten thousands or lakhs of meditation centers all over the world. There are so many meditators practicing meditation. There are so many people teaching meditation. And even in U.S., there are non-religious -relig meditations being taught without any spiritual faith or without any religious faith. They think that there is no need to have a religious faith, no need to have a spiritual faith. They think that all these are dogmatic and they have their own strange methods of meditation. And they perform meditation only for calming the mind. They perform meditation not for the sake of self-realization. They perform meditation only for calming the mind. They use it as a therapy now. In that way, even the people who practice Laya Yoga, they are also lost. How are we sure that the people who practice meditation are going to be self-realized? Now coming to Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga is applying force. Actually, it is applying force on the body, applying force on the breath, applying force on the mind, applying force on the intellect. Applying force on all the lower four koshas so as to reach to the Anandamaya kosha. But in the name of Hatha Yoga, now what is happening all over the world? Ayangar Yoga, Bikram Yoga, Chair Yoga, Sex Yoga, Beer Yoga, Goat Yoga, Shoe Yoga. What type of stupidity? What are they really teaching? Power Yoga, Vinyasa Yoga. What are they teaching? Actually, yoga is one. How can there be a personalized names for the yogic systems? But now they have made it that way. When they started marketing yoga, they have made it that way. They have kept their own names for their teachings. But how come they learnt all these things? Did they not learn these things from their gurus? Are they spiritual masters? They have. But later on, they kept their own names or many other strange names. Many times crooked names. Many times unhealthy names. Absurd names. And what have they done in the name of Hatha Yoga? Different types of circus practices or different types of gym practices. What are they? They have brought down the system of Hatha Yoga into only physical practices. Hundreds and hundreds of Yogasana postures. Hundreds and hundreds of different systems. Actually Hatha Yoga means applying force on everything else which is ruling the ego so as to become egoless. Instead in the name of Hatha Yoga, ego is being increased now. When a yoga asana competition is organized and when there are three prizes announced, what is that happening? Is the ego being reduced or is the ego being increased? What are these people doing to the system of yoga? They themselves don't know the harm which they are causing to the holy system of yoga. Actually, when they market the science of yoga in this way, they are in fact insulting the millennium tradition of the holy system of yoga or the holy science of yoga. I don't know, maybe Adi Shankara or Swami Vivekananda, they have to come back once again to scold these people or to punish these people who are polluting the system of yoga as such. Of course, it is not in my hands or in your hands. We can only discuss these things in this small platform. Hardly one person is talking and hardly 20 people are listening. We may not be able to make any remarkable change in whatever is happening. 
but the only thing what i can do is i can try to teach the real yoga without marketing it without polluting it without giving a different name to it i can try to teach the ashtanga yoga as it is defined by patanjali i can teach the mantra yoga as it is laya yoga as it is hatha yoga as it is raja yoga as it is that is what i can do sincerely and i am bestowed upon with the grace of my holy lineage which belongs to dr swami geetananda giri which belongs to kanakananda bhrugu that way i feel i am fortunate so now mantra yoga is lost laya yoga is lost hatha yoga is lost now coming to raja yoga basically raja yoga means you become a ruler for yourself means your ego is ruled by your self that is the true meaning of raja yoga now even this word is being misinterpreted in many other ways where many other systems also call their system as raja yoga and they give many other different verifications or different types of their own nomenclatures just to define their own system of raja yoga but my dear audience if you are seriously interested you can read shiva samhita and you can directly understand the meaning of these four terminologies now the people who have polluted all these four systems of yoga i sincerely feel that they have not read shiva samhita at all if they would have read shiva samhita and if they would have understood the mindset of the yogi who had written that book shiva samhita they would never dare to have their own different definitions for the four systems of yoga it is the ignorant ones who are committing mistakes in even polluting the so called spiritual science but as such lord says in the gita that yada ilahi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam srijamyaham paritranaya sadhonam vinashaya ch duskritam dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge somehow in one way or the other in every century some holy person will come and in one way or the other all the mistakes which are done by the previous people he is going to be eradicated and he is going to be cleansed and the history has been evident for this particular fact especially in the holy land of india every century one or the other holy person comes into picture so as to bring a great change and this has been going on since many millenniums that way we should feel fortunate that the number of yogis who are born in this holy land of bharata so many numbers of yogis are never born in any other countries on this world on this earth now why should i say again that maharshi patanjali is the greatest scientist because he came to know that if these four branches are independently functioning then there are chances that these people will get involved in only those acts which they are doing and they will get lost now maharshi patanjali very systematically took many things from many places and put it all into one system called ashta anga yoga yoga with eight limbs of practices that is why maharshi patanjali system of ashtanga yoga is designed as a combination of all of the above yogic methods why in the yoga asana asana and in pranayama there is hatha yoga and in dharana there is mantra yoga in dhyana there is laya yoga in samadhi there is raja yoga or for the uh, audience which are of the feminine gender i can always say that instead of raja yoga you can take it as rani yoga so 
in the Maharshi Patanjali system of Ashtanga Yoga. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. Out of these eight, Asana and Pranayama are basically applying force on the body and the breath. That is part of Hatha Yoga. Pratyahara Dharana can be part of Mantra Yoga. And Dhyana can be part of Laya Yoga. And Samadhi can be part of Raja Yoga. That way, very wisely, very intelligently, Maharshi Patanjali put all these practices into one system called Ashtanga Yoga. Now let me discuss more about Ashtanga Yoga. The Ashtanga Yoga consists of eight disciplines. Ashta Anga Yoga. Eight disciplines. First discipline is Yama. Balance with the society. Yama will contain another five sets called Ahimsa, Satya, Aste, Brahmacharya, Aparigraha. Let me discuss these five things later on, not now. Now this is balance with the society. A yogi has to be with the society only. If a yogi is remaining away from the society, in what way a yogi can bring change to the society? In what way the people can be guided? So the point here is, a yogi or a realized person cannot be away from the society. He has to be within the society. My Paramaguru, Dr. Swami Gitananda Giri, his childhood name was Ananda. And he had a great guru called Ram Gopal Mazumdar. Later on, when he took up sannyasa, he was called as Kanakananda Prabhu. Now, when my Paramaguru, Ananda was studying under his guru or master, the Guru used to tell him that you now learn yoga, gradually you learn medicine only and you practice medicine. When you practice medicine and when you learn medicine, later on you teach yoga also so that people will believe in you. When a qualified doctor talks about yoga, people will definitely believe. And through his master's instruction, Ananda studied MBBS. He became a qualified medical doctor. Now when he became a qualified medical doctor, his guru told him, you should go to the West now. You should go to the West. You should teach yoga to them because there are well-educated fools living there who are in the name of education and technology who are actually spoiling their own lives. So, when you teach yoga to them, being a qualified doctor, you practice medicine also, but keep on teaching yoga to them, they will actually believe in you and you will become a cause for their evolution or development. Now, that was the instruction given by my Parameshti Guru to my Parma Guru. In the same way, when Sri met his previous life's master Maheshwarnath at Badarika Ashram. For, for four years, Sri Yam stayed with his previous life's guru who is present life's guru as well. After four years, his master decided to leave his body and Sri Yam cried. Sri Yam told, no, no, my dear master, don't leave me, don't leave me. But Maheshwar not told, my time has come to leave the body. Read that wonderful book, Apprentice to Himalayan Master. And if possible, as early as possible, meet Sriyam also. When there are holy people on this earth, when you come to know of them, as early as possible, meet them. Later on, don't regret that when they leave their body, don't regret for the lifetime that you could not meet them. Okay, this is my sincere advice to you. Now, Sri Yam 
he requested pleaded his master his master maheshwarnath was always looking like a looking like a 25 year old man even though he was much aged he was looking like a 25 year old man now maheshwarnath told my time has come to leave the body now what you have to do is you have to go back to the mainstream society you have to get married you have to live among the people and you have to teach them the spiritual science in your own way you cannot stay here in badari you have to go back and that is how sri m came back and even now he lives in the mainstream society only guiding so many people in his own way whatever names i have mentioned now these people are really very rare these holy people never try to sell themselves these holy people never try to pollute the science of yoga these holy people remain at the backstage only but it is for the serious aspirants to search for such masters it is told in the theosophical domain that when the student is ready the teacher will appear it is for the student to become ready the teacher will somehow appear because the teacher is already within so now ashtanga yoga in the beginning itself tells about yama ahimsa satya asteya brahmacharya aparigraha which means a person who is a spiritual aspirant or the person who is aspiring to practice yoga he must be in balance with the society that is the first requirement now the second requirement is called niyama niyama means balance with the self shaucha santosha tapas swadhyaya ishvara pranidhana these five are called niyama again let me not talk about these five now let me talk about these five later on in much more detail now initially a yogi aspirant has to be having a balance with the society later on the yogi aspirant has to be having a balance with himself or herself also if there is no balance then otherwise whatever asana whatever pranayama whatever pratyahara dharana dhyana whatever type of meditation whatever type of breathing whatever type of physical postures it is not going to help in any way if there is no balance in the beginning that is how we can see that for some of the so called yogis when their life is under imbalance how can we expect that they will bring balance with the society and with the self when themselves are under great imbalance how can you expect that they will bring balance with the society that is why patanjali initially says yama next he says niyama what i feel is patanjali would have taken some of these principles from jainism and buddhism as well because patanjali came much after mahavira tirthankara or gautama buddha gautama buddha used to always tell one single sentence ahimsa paramo dharma and the same thing was later on taught by mahavira tirthankara as well now buddhism has lost its earlier flavor now we don't see such impact of gautama buddha's teachings on the prevalent buddhism which is there on earth there are many variants in buddhism now and the original teachings of buddha whether it is being followed or not is a bigger question but we are happy to say that whatever teaching was done by mahavira tirthankara even now it is being followed by so many jain aspirants so many people who belong to the jainism even today they follow very seriously very religiously they follow ahimsa so what i feel is this ahimsa satya asteya brahmacharya aparigraha which is already defined in the jainism as well the same five things 
were defined into the yogic system by Patanjali. That means just like a honeybee collects lot of nectar from different flowers and it stores it in its honeycomb and later on that the same thing becomes honey. Same way Patanjali must have taken many good things from many systems of spiritual practices and then he must have defined the complete system of Ashtanga Yoga. So the first one is Yama, second one is Niyama. The third one is Asana. Asana is to work on the body. I keep saying that is full body and peaceful mind will be useful. Body has to be really very flexible. Otherwise, with aging, body becomes rigid, body becomes tough. Now, to prevent the rigidity or the toughness of the body, body must be given a particular force by means of which body should be made to be a slave of yourself. Which means, when you want to sit down, you should be easily be able to sit down. When you want to stand up, you should be able to stand up immediately. If you want to bend down and touch your feet, you should be able to do it without any much bigger effort. In that case, your body will remain your slave. And when your body remains your slave, if you want to sit for meditation for hours together, your body will not have a pain or ache if you make your body as your slave. Otherwise, in most of the cases, people become slaves of their own bodies. They don't try to make the body as their slave. How can we expect that people can sit for meditation for hours together when they do not practice any asana? That is why Patanjali says, Sthiram Sukham Asanam. I have been telling you the examples of people snoring when they are sitting in the posture of meditation. Why they snore? Because they have become the slaves of their own bodies. They can't sit erect for let us say 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. When they can't sit erect and when they can't gently close their eyes and when they can't remain alert for 10, 20, 30 minutes. How can you expect that they will develop the concentration of the mind? Or how can we expect that they will be fit for self-realization? That is why Patanjali says, Asana is work on the body to make the body as your slave. Now the next one is Pranayama. Pranayama, different dimension on the life energy or the life force. Now what is this Pranayama? Work on the breath. As soon as you came out of your mother's womb, breathing started. You were not given any instruction to start the breathing. Actually, you are not actually doing the breathing now also. Breathing is happening on its own. Now, when you leave the body, breathing stops. The breathing stops, you leave the body. Which one starts first? You came out of the mother's womb, breathing started, right? When you came out of the mother's womb, breathing started. Breathing did not start before. That is self-evident. Now the next thing is, will you leave the body first, then breathing will stop? Or will the breathing stop and you will leave the body later? You will say, we don't know sir, we have not died, no? You should ask us when we die. Now how can I ask you when you die? You will not be there anymore. I should ask you now itself. Think over it. Will you die first physically and then the breathing will stop? Or will the breathing stop first, then you will die next? Obviously, the second one will happen. Breathing will stop first, then you will die next. Heart will stop first, then you will die next. Because when you came out of the womb, later on breathing started. So naturally, breathing has to stop, then the test to commence. Now the question is, breathing is going on from birth till death, but you did not understand the breathing at all. You did not bother about this breathing process at all. 
most of activity that single activity is earn money spend money earn money spend money earn money spend money nothing else eat fit and meet that's all they are neither bothered about the breathing that is happening in their body if at all if someone asks them what is breathing they will say it is some physiochemical process or it is some biological and chemical process some process that is happening inside the body that is governed by the brain neurons are working heart is beating something is happening inside why should we bother about it let us earn money let us spend money that is our primary goal of life they may give such stupid answers now if at all you have to really understand your existence you should understand this basic principle of breathing when you come out of the womb breathing is commenced without your knowledge at least now you try to understand the process of breathing how is it happening inside your body how it got commenced and why it will stop how it will stop there is a process called kevala kumbhaka in the yogic practice i will not tell you now it is inappropriate to discuss all those great things right now i am going to discuss all those things only when we really start the practical sessions until then let it remain as it is but when we start the practical sessions you remind me at that time i will tell about this kevala kumbhaka if you are curious now itself read the book yoga taravali written by adi shankara you will come to know about what do i mean by kevala kumbhaka in whatever state sadashiva brahmendra was there that was called kevala kumbhaka means only kumbhaka no puraka no rechaka that means no breathing in no breathing out only holding the breath there breath will never go in breath will never go out means air will never go in air will never go out it is as if it is like a pot which is submerged or immersed in water the pot is inside the water and water is inside the pot there is nothing called inside there is nothing called outside water is not going in water is not going out because pot is inside water in the same way sadashiva brahmendras body used to be there in kevala kumbhaka air never used to go in air never used to go out because he used to stay in samadhi now if kevala kumbhaka has to happen then the breath has to be understood using a spiritual angle not using a physiological angle or not using a biological angle or not using a neurological angle breath has to be understood through the spiritual angle for that purpose people have to practice pranayama okay what is the question question is what is shunyaka puraka is breathing in kumbhaka is holding it in rechaka is breathing out and shunyaka is holding it out take breath in that is called puraka and hold the breath in that is called kumbhaka now push the breath out that is called rechaka after you push the breath out leave the breath out only and remain empty in the lungs that is called shunyaka these are four parts of breathing i will tell you more about them when we start practical sessions only because they are more of practical type and there is no need to discuss all of them now in the theoretical session but these four are part of pranayama so that you will exactly understand the relationship between your breathing and the prana prana is the outcome of the breathing and through breathing how prana gets generated in your body if you have to understand that then you will have to have a control over the breathing process so pranayama is the work on the breath so out of the eight parts we have discussed the four parts let me come to the fifth part the fifth part is pratyahara that is work on the mind prati ahara ahara means in kannada ahara means food 
in sanskrita ahara means a plus hr harati harayati haraha that is the etymology of this word ahara means the one which goes towards it the one which takes away that is called ahara now for the mind what is ahara the sense organs inputs are ahara means for the mind what are the inputs from your five sense organs whatever information goes based on that the mind starts working now if the mind keeps on working on the sensory inputs senses also will not take rest mind also will not take rest as long as you are in the awakened state and mind becomes habitually programmed only to process sensory information eyes will keep on seeing ears will keep on listening tongue will keep on tasting nose will keep on smelling skin will keep on touching and because of these five sensory inputs mind will keep on working only on these five sensory inputs and it will gradually initiate such activities now when will this self realization happen if the mind is involved only in these mundane activities or the sensory activities so somehow mind has to be dissociated or mind has to be detached from the sensory inputs if it has to be detached from the sensory inputs when you close your eyes you will not see anything when you close your ears you will not hear anything when you close your eyes, you anything when you do in all your functional activity you will not touch anything in a left Five sensory inputs. Now the mind has nothing else to do, but you are awake. When mind has nothing else to do, you are still awake. Now you may ask, how will we remain awake when we eyes? If you have been awake even after closing the eyes, that means your body must have energy for the body to have enough. Have practiced pranayama before. if you don't practice pranayama then when you sit for meditation you will definitely get sleep because your body is programmed to sleep whenever you close your eyes that is how your body has been habituated by your lifestyle now when you close your eyes also you should not sleep means your body must have enough energy if your body must have enough energy you must have practice pranayama before now after pranayama you have practiced why because you should sit steadily for maybe 20 minutes 30 minutes 40 50 minutes 60 later i'm initiate all of you into the gayatri mantra in practical sessions then in i am switch on my video you are going to switch on your video to so, sit steadily there and Hundred times the Gayatri mantra, the whole one, you will have to repeat three times. Then they say that now you have been. Otherwise, it may be simply just exhibit. If you have to sit for chant Gayatri mantra hundred and eight times, how much of time is going to be? Shaking your head, you should not. Your mobile app going here and there. Nothing. You should simply be sitting steady. Final activity must be focusing only on the chanting. If that has to happen, you must have prepared your sitting posture. If you get sleepy, you must have prepared. I am not before. Enough energy will not induce if this to happen. Where the mind instead of prat means whatever it was doing earlier, the mind was now. Associate your mind from the sensory inputs. 
you will have to give some other task to the mind that is called pratyahara prati ahara the one is dharana now gradually when your mind is dissociated from your sensory inputs now what will happen is mind will become your slave mind will be under your control when the mind is under your control now you adopt a concentration of the mind in such a way that you will see the inner world now till now your mind has been watching the outer world actually this concentration is nothing new people keep saying that they don't get concentration at all which is false now many of my students say that they don't get concentration for studies i ask them in a reverse way when they watch a cricket match they'll be watching the cricket match with a lot of concentration only when they watch the textbook or notes then they don't have that concentration which means they are telling lie whatever they like to do when they keep doing whatever they like to do they will have enough concentration whatever they don't like to do then they say i don't get concentration there they are cheating themselves everyone will have the concentration they cannot say that they don't have a concentration only thing is concentration can be used for some other task now if somebody is uh, busy in collecting coins imagine somebody has a hobby of collecting coins or collecting stamps for those people they will be heavily concentrating on different types of stamps to be collected or different types of coins to be collected and they will build up a small museum at their home itself and they will write notes for all these coins which are collected or stamps which are collected they get a lot of concentration for doing all those tasks but if at all they are given some other task they may say that i don't get concentrated on that now that concentration is a personal choice whatever they like to do they will somehow develop concentration for that because that is going to be their basic nature that way now in yoga why concentration comes into picture because in yoga the purpose is self realization if the purpose is self realization then the mind cannot go outward now the mind has to develop concentration inward because the truth is within there is no point in searching for a truth outside there is no point in fish searching for water outside fish has to look for water within because the water is within the fish itself there is no point in you searching for god outside you will have to search for god within god is always accessible to you that way but without understanding this fact without knowing that the creator cannot be away from the creation people have many such dogmatic faiths people have many such false beliefs that god is somewhere in the heaven god is somewhere in some other realm some other loka god is far away from us that is where people are lost if you have to find god within then you have to have concentration within what is the full form of mind mind as a very beautiful full form move inward now discover m i n d move inward now discover that the self is within the divinity is within the creator is within so this way dharana is basically adopting concentration within to some extent even in the yogic practices there are some methods such as jyoti trataka and bimba trataka there we are trying to adopt concentration for some other object which is outside such as a lamp or such as an image in the mirror but those are some practices which are utilized to bring the vacillating mind into control but later on the concentration has to be basically utilized for looking within we have two methods called mandala dharana 
and Saptabindu Dharana. Later on, we have one more method called Gayatri Dharana. All these three Dharana practices are going to be practiced within. That way, the purpose of Dharana is adopting concentration to watch the one who is inside us. Inside you, inside me. Next comes Dhyana. Regarding Dhyana, I have spoken enough in the previous sessions. Attaining contemplation. After adopting concentration within, gradually you will develop awareness, you will become sensitive, you will gradually try to understand more about your own body, you will try to understand more about your own breathing, you will try to understand more about your own mind, you will try to understand more about your own intellect. In this process, gradually your ego will keep on getting reduced and someday when you become empty, he will fill you. If he has to fill you, you should become empty. That is the only way. As long as you are full, he cannot fill you with anything else. You have made yourself full with a lot of ignorance. Now, remove all that, become empty, he will fill you with his knowledge when you become innocent. Remember the story of Santayakanatha. There is a beautiful sentence in philosophy which says, Nature abhors vacuum. Means, nature does not want anything to be unfilled. Wherever there is vacuum, there also nature will fill gravitational force. Actually, in the universe, there is nothing called vacuum. Whatever in the conventional way they say, vacuum is absence of air. But in the free space, even when there is no air, there is still the magnetic field. Because of this magnetic field itself, planets are revolving around stars and stars are moving in the Milky Way galaxy and the galaxy itself is moving in a very fast speed in the whole of the universe and where all these are moving and to which extent these are moving, we are completely unaware of. We cannot imagine the way in which the whole of the universe is moving. Everything is under movement. And that is all because of the magnetic energy which is all pervading. So, nature abhors vacuum. In the same manner, when you make yourself empty, nature will fill you with its consciousness. That is the basic purpose of dhyana. Lastly, samadhi. This has been the most misunderstood word with the normal people. In the case of normal people, samadhi means a tomb or a structure where some nameplate will be there like date of birth, date of death, janana, marana. That is what people think. Now that is not samadhi. Sam a adhi is the etymology of this word samadhi. Adhi means the one which is above and which is controlling everything from above. A means going towards that, the one which is above all that. Sam means with full effort. In Sanskrita, even the usage of Upasarga is going to have a greater meaning. So Sam is Upasarga, A is Upasarga, Adhi is the word. Sam A Adhi means with full effort, with full faith, going towards the one which is actually governing all of us. So in totality, Samadhi means achieving union with the divinity, achieving union with the self, achieving union with the God. Now you may appreciate me when I say that Patanjali is the greatest scientist on this earth. All other scientists work on the external objects and they try to find out the relationship between the external things. 
the external energies but patanjali worked on the internal objects and he deduced the relationship between the internal energies and he gave a system where union with the divinity can happen now with the external scientists yoga can never happen because they are always looking outward patanjali says go inward and achieve this union if the fish has to have a union with water fish need not go anywhere fish need not search for water anywhere fish need not worship water anywhere fish need not construct a temple for water anywhere fish need not follow any vows or vratas any time what the fish is supposed to do is just go within and understand the water that is within and be with the water that is within that itself is samadhi again recall the story of sadashiva brahmendra which i have told you you will understand samadhi in a much better way in kannada there is a book called yek dagella aite and this is the story of one swami called mukundur swami and his life account was written by belgare krishna shastri me and my students have visited the places where mukundur swami had lived he had lived in a hillock and later on he had lived in a graveyard we had visited both the places and we keep visiting the hillock every now and then now also there is a swami ji who is taking care of that particular place okay that is called malle devrapura near holenar sipra there is a small hillock where this mukundur swami stayed in the early part of his life later on he shifted a place to some other place near banavara that is called maragondana halli there he lived in a graveyard and he had dug a small cave in the graveyard underground then there he used to meditate this mukundur swami used to say one sentence in kannada very beautiful sentence satmelanta samadhi iravaga samadhi agbekappa he used to funnily say that what is that samadhi after death you should achieve samadhi when you are alive whatever is the samadhi after death is that concrete cement mud structure where your name plate will be kept that is of no use you should have samadhi when you are alive mukund swami used to directly say even though he used to say funnily this sentence had a great meaning satmelanta samadhi iravaga samadhi agbekappa anyway at the end of this presentation i am going to show you all the sayings of that great swami ji mukundur swami ji now that is what is samadhi let me proceed in the name of formal education people spend decades in acquiring the material knowledge and later they expect to obtain spiritual knowledge urgently how is it possible how is it possible <laughs> just by means of some initiation just by means of going to temples just by means of getting dedicated to a particular ashram or to a particular system or a particular meditation center people want to get spiritual knowledge urgently how is it possible up to 7th standard primary schooling up to 10th standard high schooling so totally 10 years are gone there next puc 2 years degree 3 years or 4 years again another 15 years are gone there now when you finish a degree your age will be somewhere around 22 to 23 24 now as soon as you finish a degree either your parents or your relatives they will tell you get into a job or get into a business start earning money now you will get into a job or get into a business you will start earning money and you will spend decades in this acquiring of the material knowledge itself and how is it possible that nearly 25 years are lost only in the material education and your mind is corrupted right 
and if you remain in the same process then your mind can remain contaminated for the next 25 years also now to make the mind pure once again you will have to put a lot of efforts you will have to become innocent once again like a child you will have to shed your ego all the eight types of arrogances and the six types of enemies you will have to eradicate all of them that requires much larger effort now how can you expect that you will obtain spiritual knowledge urgently how is it possible if you have to obtain spiritual knowledge urgently you will have to completely submit yourself in the feet of some master who is able to teach you you should find for a true spiritual master and you have to completely submit and dedicate yourself for learning afresh once again by completely formatting your mind clean only then i can say that you will now start gaining spiritual knowledge otherwise don't think that just by reading books just by listening to my presentations just by getting into some meditation classes just by visiting temples regularly or just by going for pilgrimages you will get any spiritual knowledge that is not possible if you follow the system of ashtanga yoga only then i can assure you that you will definitely get spiritual knowledge but that also not urgently that's not possible because first is yama then niyama then asana then pranayama then pratyahara then dharana then dhyana if at all you become really successful in dhyana then we can think about having samadhi otherwise samadhi will anyhow happen after you leave your physical body again mukundur swami says what satmelen tadri samadhi iravaga agbaka pa samadhi now you may ask me sir did you have experience of samadhi i will not tell you now i will not tell you now let me tell you when the time comes when you are ready to receive let me think of telling you all those things not now because as of now i don't believe any of you why should i believe any of you i don't know whether how much of commitment you have towards the learning in future because i have been seeing the numbers are reducing again and again again and i used to joke with my good friend gopi that at the end only me and him may remain because he was asking for all these spiritual classes right so at that time i had joke maybe at the end only me and him will remain let me see how many will remain till the end only then let me think about to telling all my secrets to you otherwise whatever i have told till now that is enough now to conclude with this particular uh, session today i will tell you the story of bertrand russell bertrand russell was one of the greatest philosophers on this earth recent philosopher in the previous century he was there in usa this bertrand russell had read lots of books lots of books about sociology about philosophy about religions he had read lots of books and because of the reading of lots of books he was having lot of intellectual ability and he used to think in his own way that he is a highly knowledgeable person and even people used to appreciate him that he is a very high level knowledgeable person some day some indian philosopher was talking to bertrand russell i don't know who was that person i really don't know so this indian philosopher asked bertrand russell have you read the upanishads now bertrand russell asked what are upanishads now the indian philosopher said they are the scriptures written right from the vedic times in the indian tradition or we should say sanatana tradition bharatiya tradition now bertrand russell casually or carelessly said oh, what is there in that i have read almost all the books on this earth i can read upanishads also what is there in that now the indian told 
first read them they are all in sanskrita you may not be able to read them in sanskrita at least there are translated versions which are available in english read them there are more than 108 upanishads as such but adi shankara and later on another four acharyas they have written commentaries on the upanishads in fact adi shankara wrote the commentary on the upanishads for the first time for the selected 12 upanishads later on ramanuja acharya also wrote later on madhva acharya also wrote later on vallabha acharya also wrote nimbarka acharya also wrote so that way these five acharyas who wrote the bhashyas they were called as five philosophical systems in india now the indian philosopher did not tell all these things to bertrand russell because the bertrand russell will not understand all this bhashya commentary and all that so he told bertrand russell you just pick up out of this 10 upanishads isha kena katha prashna mundaka mandukya tittiri aitareyancha chandogyam brahadaratakam tatha that way there are 10 upanishads now you get the english translated version of these 10 upanishads and you read them later on let us see bertrand russell told what a big deal i have read books i have written so many books i am a quite knowledgeable person i am capable of reading anything let me get those 10 english translated versions and let me read them he told it so casually but for reading the 10 upanishads even the translated version <coughs> bertrand russell took more than a year some portions he could not understand at all because upanishads are not so easy to be understood because upanishads talk only about the self only about the self only about the god only about the consciousness nothing else now bertrand russell could not understand many statements of the upanishads also somehow he completed the 10 translated versions and after a year the same indian philosopher met him now bertrand russell told the indian philosopher that i was having a heavy arrogance earlier that i have read almost all the books on this earth and i know everything i have a lot of knowledge of everything now i feel so happy that one fool is reduced in the world this is the exact sentence which bertrand russell told now i am so happy that one fool is reduced in the world which means now bertrand russell understood what a foolish fellow he was he was reading about everything else but he had not read about self he had not read about consciousness as it is directly discussed in the upanishads now when bertrand russell himself says that he was fool until then and now he feels happy that one fool is reduced in the world my dear friends how many of you have read the upanishads my dear friends how many indians have read the upanishads my dear friends how many indians know that there are upanishads now who should be at fault at least bertrand russell read the upanishads what about the indians what do they read daily now and then daily in the newspaper they read the corona count daily in the newspapers and in different magazines what do they read now how can you expect that fools will be reduced if fools has to be reduced we will have to read whatever wise people have written earlier so my dear friends read these 10 upanishads even if it is english translation fine read it for the kannada people i should say that ramakrishna ashrama has published a beautiful book called 
Upanishad Bhavadhari. And that has been written by one great saint called Somanathananda. Kannada people can definitely buy this particular book, Upanishad Bhavadhari, written by Somanathananda, and start reading it. Someday you tell me that one fool is reduced on this world. I will be happy to hear. Let me end today's meeting. Let us meet tomorrow.